Yes, guys. So today I've got something a little bit fun for you to watch today. We're going to be talking about the history and evolution of wigs and modern day hair systems. Something a little bit different, something to sink your teeth into, something which I've been really interested in the last couple of weeks. So I've been doing a little bit of research and some of this information is absolutely fascinating and it goes back a long, long way. Now, before I dive into this topic, if you are interested in getting a hair system and you want one that maybe looks a little bit like mine, then consider levividhairsystem.com. They are offering 15% off any stock hair system. This one is called the Tyler. You can find the information in the description box below, but make sure you stick around till the end of this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow and it helps more people find this content. So let's learn a little bit more about the history and evolution of wigs and hair systems. So as you can see, wigs date back a long time. They date back almost three and a half thousand years. They date all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. Wigs are pre-Jesus, guys. That's how long wigs have been around. So let's learn a little bit more about them. So on this website, it says they were used for multiple different purposes. They were handmade, of course. There'd been no industrial revolution at that time. Um, so everything was pretty much handmade. I'm not even 100% sure they'd invented the wheel by this point. But they were, made, they were handmade and made from a different, a number of different fabrics. So they were discovered around 3,400 BC. So initially, I read that as 3,400 years ago. I make a mistake. We're talking 5,400 years ago. Because obviously, since BC, we've had another 2,000 years. So wigs are even older than I first envisioned. So they were inspired by the hot sun in the hot desert. Obviously, anyone who's been to Egypt, I include myself in that, it's really hot. Especially in summer, you're looking at plus 100 Fahrenheit every single day. It's pretty unbearable. Which is why I'm wondering, why are you wearing wigs? <laughs> Managing hair in those weather conditions was hard, so the Egyptians shaved their hair. Now, this makes a lot more sense. So shave your hair and then, you know, when you've got a sort of bald head, it's much easier to manage the heat. However, the bald head was not considered trendy, so they decided to cover and protect it from the scorching sun with wigs. Now, to me, that sounds pretty unbearable. So shaved head makes sense, but obviously they were quite unfashionable at the time. So wear a wig to make yourself look cool. But in that weather and using the methods they probably used back then, wigs were probably pretty hot and uncomfortable to wear. Wigs at the upper class wall were very different to the lower class. The latter wore wigs made from wool and leaf fibers. So you're in 100 Fahrenheit weather every day and you're wearing a wig made out of wool and leaf fibers. That doesn't sound comfortable. The upper class wigs were made of human hair. Some were even made of silver. Now that is absolutely fascinating. But what we can see quite early on as well, which is really interesting, they're a sign of your social status and an indicator of the state of your personal wealth. Now that is really interesting. Let's move on to the 17th and 18th century. I'm assuming there's nothing that happened between 5,400 years ago and the 17th and 18th century, by the way. Maybe there were some advancements in wigs, but this is all I could find. So in the 17th century, you've probably seen movies or images or portraits of people in what we in the UK class as the Georgian era. So this is the 1700s to the 1800s. And then from the 1800s to the 1900s, we've got what's called the Victorian era. This is called the white coloured wig era. You still see these in court, so barristers sometime, sometimes wear these. The 17th century was when wigs became really popular and acceptable for both genders. So this is even when women started wearing wigs and it was deemed to be quite fashionable, quite popular. Even the French king, I think this was Louis the 16th or 14th, who always used false hair pieces, used to make up for his thinning hair by finally moving on to wigs. So this is the first time where we're genuinely seeing wigs being used to cover up male pattern baldness. So yes, probably a sign of social status, but also to hide up a balding and receding hairline. Very, very interesting development. The servants would shave him bald every day and he would wear a wig. In this era, the bulkier the hair was, the better it was. So in modern day terms, the thicker the hair system, the thicker the density, the better the wig, I suppose, the better the appearance for the person wearing the wig. 
They were sold at a for high. They were sold at a higher price, and they are primarily worn during formal occasions. So the rich had two set of wigs, I assume because one would need washing every now and then. I'm also assuming that these wigs weren't made out of human hair. I could be mistaken, but the fact that you could wear wigs during this period for years at a time indicates that me indicates to me that it was possibly uh, made out of a synthetic, a synthetic material. I did also read somewhere that Elizabeth I started wearing wigs. She used to wear lead makeup, I think it was. And it caused her lead based makeup and it caused her hair to fall out. So she started wearing wigs. That's sort of like the late 17th century. So the late 1600s, we knew about wigs being worn by the nobility, by monarchs, especially in the UK. The lower class, the lower class who couldn't afford wigs would style their hair naturally to appear like a wig. <laughs> that probably would have looked quite funny. That's how fashionable wigs were in these centuries. I kind of wonder whether people with complete male pattern baldness who are sort of uh, living in poverty or, you know, working class would sort of pull the hair from the side. You'd see this in the 60s, almost like a comb over thing. I wonder if that's what they did back then. I'd be very interested to know. I'd love to go back in time and work these things out. Another huge trend in this century was the white wig. It was considered very stylish. So now, not only are we seeing it as a social status thing, not only are we seeing it as a sort of hair loss solution, we're seeing it as a fashion item. Everyone used to wear them. You'd see people in the English court wearing them. You'd see people in the French court wearing them, deemed to be the two most fashionable courts in the world, or at least in Europe at the time. Hairdressers came up with ideas to powder wigs and they bejeweled women's wigs to give them an even more glamorous look. Very, very interesting. A point I'd like to make here as well, a really interesting point, is that back then sanitation isn't what it is now. Sanitation wasn't really important until the 1880s when Louis Pasteur actually discovered that microbes can be transmitted from our hands to our mouths pardon me, and cause uh, infectious disease. So before that time, such a thing as showers daily, baths daily, these weren't a thing. So can you imagine how much those wigs must have smelt? They must have smelt really bad. That's probably why uh, people had a number of wigs, because you might need to wash a wig just to stop it from smelling so much and use your other wig in the meantime. So we owe our historical fashion wigs to a king. Known as the Dancing Sun King, Louis XIV, I think I've got my Roman numerals right there, was considered a fashion center. Sen th fashion setter. Apologies. During his youth, he wore his hair long, but as his hair began to turn thin, he turned to wigs. Now, this is quite another interesting reason why wigs, modern day hair systems, were popular in the 1600s. In the 1600s, there was a major rise in cases of syphilis. I shouldn't laugh, it's a horrible disease. And some of the most obvious signs of the disease were skin sores, rashes, and patchy hair loss. Bald patches were considered undignified, and this goes back to the male pattern baldness issue. Clearly, humans were becoming a lot more self-conscious of their appearance at this time, possibly more vain as well. England's King Charles II, who was cousin of Louis XIV, was showing common signs of syphilis when he started to wear a wig. Almost by accident, wigs almost solved another common 17th century problem, head lies. As I mentioned about a minute ago, sanitation pretty much wasn't in existence back then. I think they did have baths, but it was about once every three months. The English and French courts must, must have stank to high heaven because sanitation just wasn't a thing. It wasn't a dumb thing then. They didn't realise what caused infectious disease. They didn't realise sanitation could actually massively reduce the instance of pandemics and epidemics and that kind of thing. So it solved lice. Head lice were everywhere in the Middle Ages and not only did they cause a lot of discomfort, but they transmitted a lot of diseases. But in order for the wigs to fit properly, people needed to have their heads shaved off, eliminating the lice problem in the process. Now, this is something I find fascinating. Talking about sanitation, to fight the smell of the wigs, wig makers came up with a plan. Flour mixed with chalk and kaolin, a type of soft clay, and perfumed with lavender, so they smelt nicer. 
As a bonus, the powder would make white wigs, the most expensive, even whiter, so they look brighter and renewed after every powdering. Absolutely genius. A, a, a medieval shampoo. I love it. Now, as we move into like the 19th and the 20th century and even the 21st, as time passed, the market continued to grow. There's the market for wigs. And wig dealers started importing human hair. So they're genuinely using human hair now rather than synthetic hair from other countries, including Japan, China and India, which is both still massive wig and hair system producers and Asia Minor. The imported hair would be boiled in nitric acid to remove the vermin and color before the sale. I don't think they had hair dyeing techniques at that time, but they were certainly human hair that people were wearing in, with wigs at the time. In the 1950s, wigs became popular again as a way of experimenting with new hairstyles without going through the hairdressing process. Now in the 1950s, a little bit of trivia for you guys. Sean Connery, the first ever James Bond, wore a wig, or as we call it now, a hair system in all of the James Bond films that he was in. The reason he did this was because when he was cast, he had quite a significant receding hairline. And the director said, no, you're James Bond, you need a full of head of hair. And they got him fitted with a hair system. If you watch the Bond films now, you can kind of see it. However, when I watched the Bond films when I was younger and I didn't know that he was wearing a hair system, I wouldn't have known. I thought it was his own hair. So I think they did a pretty good job there. Now, by the late 50s, in 1958, the wig market had grown so much that at least a third of women, a third, had one convenience wig. Obviously, think to the late 50s and the 60s. These women had these massive hairdos. They were massively on trend at, the point, at that point. And a lot of them weren't actually their hair. They were wigs. So massively back in fashion in the late 50s and the 60s. All during this period, the wig, hair system, toupee industry was growing from strength to strength. And by the 21st century, the wig industry had really significantly upgraded in terms of authenticity and style. So, for example, unlike traditional wigs, which you might have got in the earlier 20th century and before then, modern wigs that we've got now, hair systems, toupees, have natural hairlines. You wouldn't know it's a wig unless you look really closely and even then a lot of the time you cannot tell so that's that for today guys the history and evolution of wigs and hair systems i hope you guys have found that really interesting i did my research on this and i found it fascinating really really interesting and it gives you something a little bit different away from modern hair systems to focus on to focus on a journey a five and a half thousand year journey that wigs have been on from ancient egyptians to present day now guys if you found that video interesting and it's piqued your interest in maybe getting a hair system why not just check out this video i made a couple of months ago where i talk about in depth the importance of using a trusted supplier when it comes to getting hair back on your head. If you've got any other ideas of things you'd like me to talk about on my videos, let me know in the comments box below. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts and I'll speak to you very soon. Bye for now.